Welcome back. We're in the middle of uh, summarizing and reviewing Paul the missionary and uh, we've looked at uh, the first category of the 11 categories to understand Paul's life uh, and that is Paul the early years and there were actually a lot of details I think that hopefully give color and life and meaning to uh, the Apostle Paul and now we move then to the uh, following category. So the next category up is uh, Paul's conversion and obviously chronologically speaking it didn't take a long time. It didn't evolve a lot of uh, days or hours passing but nevertheless it's worthy of having its own category because it was a huge event in the Apostles life. In fact if you take seriously the point we saw in the last session namely that Paul wasn't just a Jew but he was a Pharisee Jew, and he wasn't just a Pharisee Jew, he was a zealous Pharisee Jew, then you'll appreciate what it was like for such a passionate, kind of fire-breathing, go anywhere, do anything, to persecute these Christians, what it must have been like for Paul to have this personal, first-hand encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Wow! So that's described three times in Acts the secondary source and it's found not surprisingly in the primary source as well because when push comes to shove Paul will ground his apostleship not in some church's decision you know some other apostles the head boys in Jerusalem who somehow gave him this title no 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 Paul grounds his apostleship in that uh, divine encounter with Jesus Christ himself. Galatians, for instance, will say, I did not receive the gospel from any human source, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul appeals, not surprisingly, to his conversion uh, experience a number of times in his letters, too. For instance, in Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is kind of arguing with the Corinthians, and he says, Have I not seen the Lord? And actually, the Greek question is introduced not in a neutral way, but it's introduced with a negative oo or ook, right? And that's different than the second negative, which is may. And maybe you remember how a question in Greek introduced with oo or ook is a rhetorical question. It's expecting and asserting the answer yes. And so when Paul says this question, it's really, I've seen the Lord, haven't I? And then the same thing is found in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul lists all the people that Christ has appeared to, and then it's important for Paul to say, he also appeared, last of all, to me. In fact, there's one scholar, Seyun Kim, uh, an important New Testament scholar, who, who believes that you can trace all of Paul's theology back to uh, his conversion experience. So this is category number two. Didn't take a long time, but it certainly had a huge, huge impact in Paul's life, and that's his conversion. So we move to the third category of the 11, and that's Paul's early missionary activity. Now, I want you to kind of make sure you catch this, because if we were in a Sunday school class, right, uh, this is not where we would begin, right? We would begin with Paul's first missionary journey. But no, 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 before he has his so-called first missionary journey, he's involved in some earlier missionary activity. And I want to draw your attention to the years listed there. They may be off just a little bit, but, but in terms of the difference, the, the, the length is correct. Because if you take 47 minus 33, that means that Paul was a Christian. Before he began his first missionary journey, Paul was a believer, a follower of Jesus, for at least 14 years, or possibly 17. It depends on how you add. Is it 14 plus 3, or is it 14 including the 3? I'll take the conservative, 14 including the 3. So what we need to do now is to fill this gap, right? What do we know, if anything, about this 14-year period from the time Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he began what is wrongly called the first missionary journey? So the first thing we can say about that 14-year period is that three of them was involved in ministry in, quote, Arabia. This comes from Paul's statement in Galatians where he says, uh, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. And then later I returned to Damascus, and then after three years I finally went up to Jerusalem. Now, many Christians for a long time have heard the word Arabia, and they think Arabia equals desert, and they say, okay, I know what happened. Paul had this huge dramatic encounter with Christ, and in that regard they're right. And then they say, okay, it was such a big deal that, well, it just kind of blew Paul away, and so he had to kind of go somewhere and just reflect on this for a while. So, so Paul went to Arabia, to the desert, and kind of lived like a monk, reflecting for three years about this divine encounter with Jesus. Now, I understand why people sometimes make that kind of conclusion, but I don't think it jives or agrees with what evidence exists and what we know about Paul. 
first of all, when we say Arabia, we ought to, uh, that's why I have the map here for you, you ought to see, and I'll try to highlight this for you, you ought to see that it covers quite a large area, and, and it's not like there's no one living here, there's a place called Petra, a very cool and impressive city, and there are other communities in this region called Arabia, and it also includes the city of Damascus. I'll come back to that in a second. Now, um, First of all, I don't think that Paul was out in the desert, you know, first of all, it's not just a, a desert area. You can see that there's lots of people living in this region too. Uh, and I say that because of Paul's character, right? We've already talked about how he was a zealous person and we read and maybe appreciate uh, now some of the passion he had. And, and, um, and actually I think about 1 Corinthians 9, verse it's 15 or 16, where Paul says, um, an obligation has been placed or laid upon me. And what is that obligation? He says, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. Right? So Paul had a very powerful, powerful sense that, that, a, that, a, that an obligation, not a negative obligation, a good obligation had been placed on his shoulder by no one else than Jesus Christ himself. And that obligation was for him to preach the gospel. And so Paul says, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. So, so I, I can't imagine Paul twiddling his thumbs, doing nothing but reflecting for three years in the Arabian desert. And so not only does this not jive with Paul's character, but another big clue is that text you see cited there from 2 Corinthians 11.32. Because if you look up that text, you'll see that Paul talks about King Aretas. Who is he king? He's king of the city of Damascus, which again is part of the Arabian region or area. And we read that King Aretas was apparently uh, trying to catch Paul. Now the question one naturally would ask is, well, how does King Aretas even know who Paul is, and why is he trying to catch him? Well, I guess I imagine the king might know who he is, might be trying to catch him, if Paul's been doing what he normally does, namely, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. And so I think a much more accurate picture is that Paul is doing what he has been obligated, a divine obligation been laid on him to preach the gospel, and the gospel is quite countercultural, right? There is a pushback. It does get you into trouble. And so King Aretas was then looking for Paul, and that's a reflection of the more public three-year ministry of Paul in Arabia. Well, that covers three of the 14 years. Now we go on to the next phase, and we talk about his conversion visit to Jerusalem. I think it's helpful and important to think about how many different visits that Paul makes to Jerusalem. And so this would be then uh, technically the first visit to Jerusalem as a Christian. And so another name for the first visit to Jerusalem is you could call it the conversion visit. And I have here a, a kind of classic Greek Orthodox icon of Peter and Paul hugging and and kind of kissing each other because this is a standard repre representation of the East Church and the West Church and how unified they are to be. The one apostle representing one, the other representing the other. But it didn't happen that way. If you read the account that uh, Paul came to town and the apostles weren't too excited to see Paul. It's a little bit like Paul was the hot potato, right? I don't want to meet with Paul, you meet with Paul. And the other said, no, I don't want to meet with Paul, you meet with Paul. They thought it was all part of some grand scheme, some clever plan that Paul had. And, and maybe, you know, knowing that we know about Paul, you know, how zealous he was, it sounds like he's crazy enough to do something like that. And then we read how, this is an important figure, later in Paul's life, there was Barnabas, who kind of bridged the way and introduced Paul to the apostles. And, and so Paul spent a little bit of time with them, as he says later on to the Galatians, some 15 days with Cephas, with Peter, and the other apostles. But Paul uh, is a controversial figure. And so uh, there is a big kerfuffle about Paul being there. And so the apostles say, Paul, um, you know, we appreciate your presence. We appreciate you're on our team now. But, you know, things are a little too hot for us with you around. And so uh, we think it's better for you to kind of leave town. And uh, why don't you go to, uh, let's say, oh, yeah, Tarsus. You say, of course, they send him to Tarsus because that's Paul's hometown. And so Paul leaves town and uh, he goes to Tarsus. And there he is, apparently, for 10 years. That's a long time. 10 years, and we know virtually nothing about what Paul did during this 10-year ministry in Tarsus in the province of Cilicia. Again, his character, the divine calling he had, the sense of obligation to preach the gospel are all suggestive that he was involved in some kind of ministry in this place at this time. So we have the three years in Arabia and Damascus. We have now the 10-year ministry in Tarsus. And we have one more year to fill the 14-year gap, and that is in Antioch. And what's with that? Well, uh, to use the cursor over here, as I think I'm getting used to using, um, the church in Jerusalem, an area, realized that the church in Antioch was growing by leaps and bounds. And so they sent 
Barnabas, right, up here to kind of help out the church in Antioch. And Barnabas was working up there, and uh, things were kind of heavy, and he suddenly remembered, oh yeah, Paul. And he thought Paul would be a great asset to, to the ministry in Antioch. And so uh, he left Antioch and went the short distance to Tarsus and brings Paul from Tarsus, where he's been for 10 years, over to Antioch. And the two of them minister together, although it's actually Barnabas and Saul, because Barnabas is the lead character at this stage, working together in the church in the area of Antioch. And so that rounds out then this 14-year period that I've called Paul's early missionary activity. Now, before uh, we go to the next category, though, there's one other thing that happens during this time, and that is the famine relief visit. So if you go back to this slide, the church in Antioch in the north heard that the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea were in need. And so they put together uh, an offering, and so somebody had to bring that, and so they chose Barnabas and Paul. So Barnabas and Paul go to Jerusalem, and so if you're keeping track, as I am, and I think it's helpful to do, how many times Paul goes to Jerusalem, this would be now the second visit to Jerusalem. And if you want to give a different name to it so you remember it better, this would be called then the famine relief visit to Jerusalem. So the two of them go down south, bring the offering, and apparently return to Antioch. Well, now we move to the next phase. Uh, now we finally get to our Sunday school understanding of Paul, and we finally get to something called the first missionary journey, even though we now know that that's not the best title, because Paul had been a Christian for a long time and had been involved in mission work already for many years. But he's in Antioch, and the church gets together, and uh, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, they set apart Barnabas and Saul, that is to Paul, to kind of begin this journey. Oh yeah, and there's a third person who joins them. His name is John Mark. And so uh, they pray over them, and uh, the Holy Spirit leads them and sends them, and they head on the first missionary journey. And here is where I become very, very brief, because you need to, and you can easily just read Acts 13.4 to 14.28, and can hear about all the things that happened to Paul. And so you ought to know how they go over to the island of Cyprus, and they go there first because Barnabas is from there, right? Why not go to a place where you have family contacts, and you can take advantage of housing and other connections? And you ought to know something about, really, a convert, the most powerful or... Um, influential or prestigious convert anywhere in Paul's life. Anyway, they leave and they sail and they arrive at Perge, and then something bad happens. Uh, John Mark bails on them. That will become important later on. So instead of the three musketeers, Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark, now it's just the two of them. They head straight north to a different Antioch, don't get confused, Antioch of Pisidia or beyond or near Pisidia. And they also go to Iconium and to Lystra and Derbe and they repeat their steps, giving elders behind. And then they come down a slightly different way. They come back the same way, but instead of sailing from Perge, if you're following the air, where they arrive, they sail from another city and a port right next door, Atalia, modern day Antalya, and then they go back to Antioch and thus ends the so-called first missionary journey. Well, the next event that I think is helpful for thinking of Paul's life, I think it's number four, is the journey to Jerusalem Council. So here is now then the third visit to Jerusalem, right? You have the conversion visit, you have the famine relief visit, and now we have the, well, you can call it the council visit. What's going on here? Well, some Christians again from the south, some Jewish Christians from Jerusalem, came north to Antioch and uh, they said, uh, you believe in Jesus? Well, that's good. We're Jesus people too. Uh, now I realize that you're Gentile, and so that means you're not part of God's covenant chosen people, but we've got good news for you. If you're just willing to do a few things, pay a little more attention to the law and watch the kind of food you eat, and oh yes, there's this little business about snip, snip, circumcision. Well, then you too can be like us. You can be the children of Abraham, full heirs of the promise and all the blessings that come from that. And so the Christians in the north didn't quite buy that right away, and so they said, you know, we better send uh, some representatives down to Jerusalem, and that's what they did, and they sent Barnabas and Paul. And so the first synod was held, not in Grand Rapids, no, it was held in Jerusalem in the year 49 A.D. And then they reached a decision, as you well know, they said that, uh, no, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but they said to themselves, that is, these predominantly Jewish Christian leaders in Jerusalem said, now, 
just because we caved in, I don't know if that's the right verb, but we'll just say it for that sake now, just because we caved in on the issue of circumcision, we don't want these Gentile Christians thinking now anything can go. So we better write them a letter, right? And we won't send it with Paul and Barnabas, we'll instead send it with two of our boys, we trust them better. And so this letter then uh, spells out some things for the Gentile Christians in Antioch in the north and in other places. And this letter has been given a name by scholars, and you should know what it is. It's called the Apostolic Decree. The Apostolic Decree, right? A decree, a letter, a decision made by the earliest apostles at the first synod in Jerusalem in 49 AD. And it's also important and helpful to know that this letter that they wrote and didn't send with Paul and Barnabas, they send with two other people, one of whom has a name Silas, Silas, which is a good foreshadowing for what's about to come up next. So we move to the next category, and that is a familiar one to you in terms of its title, the second missionary journey. So Paul and Barnabas are over here in Antioch, all right, of Syria, and they say, let's go back to the Christians on the island of Cyprus and in that Asia, the region of Asia Minor, Galatia and Phrygia and so forth, right, that we uh, started on our last journey, let's encourage them. And, and Paul said, that's a good idea, let's do that. But then there was a falling out. Uh, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark again, and Paul said, uh, no way. And he said, no way, with an exclamation mark. Um, and this is a kind of a sobering thing for us to think about, you know, that Paul, an apostle, writing later to the Corinthians, right? I'm thinking of 2 Corinthians, where he talks about a ministry of reconciliation that had been given to him, and, and, and how Paul challenges the Corinthians and other hearers to be reconciled to God and to each other. And yet we see this falling out between Paul and Barnabas. Although we should note that later on there was, I guess, some reconciliation because John Mark shows up associated with Paul later in Paul's life. And uh, we also maybe ought to account for the fact that maybe Paul felt so strongly because um, this was a significant thing. And, and John Mark seriously undermined their ministry by bailing on them in the middle of adverse situations. And finally, uh, it may be that Barnabas uh, was uh, more charitable toward John Mark because, as we read elsewhere in Scripture, he was a cousin, and so the two were related. But in any case, um, Barnabas and uh, his cousin John Mark go back to the island of Cyprus. But Paul now needs a new missionary partner, and this is where Silas comes on the scene. Remember, he's already in the area already because he's one of the people who are sharing and delivering this letter, this uh, apostolic decree from the apostles in Jerusalem. And so now we have Paul and we have Silas, and they begin by land, heading through, uh, again, Asia Minor. And along the way, they pick up uh, Timothy, and we have the three musketeers, if you will, again. And and I, I'm not going to repeat all these details, but you'll you'll know them from uh, from your reading of Acts, right? From Acts 15:36 to 18:32, lots of cities, lots of powerful and exciting things. Uh, in fact, um, too often we're overly familiar with these stories. Um, it, it's too bad we can't hear them like they would have been heard for the first time when we're kind of amazed at. Um, the miracles uh, that God performed through these apostles and how, how people, you know, were, were touched by the sermons that they preached and were convicted of their sin and committed themselves to Christ. These are powerful, amazing stories that we read here in the Acts of the Apostle. And again, a bunch of them happened during the second missionary journey. And so you should know from your reading of the Bible and uh, other um, uh, preparations uh, for uh, the assignment about how long Paul was in these places and what happened to him, that is the major events. But ultimately they return home, they land at Caesarea, and although the text of Acts doesn't say, isn't it striking here how the arrow doesn't go all the way, that's an overly literal interpretation of Acts, Acts just says that once they landed in Caesarea they went up to visit or to see the brothers. And the clear implication is they went up to Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is located a couple of thousand feet above sea level. And the Old Testament, we have the Psalms of Ascent. And so Paul clearly went to the Christians in Jerusalem and then went further north, returning to the home base of Antioch. And so if you're keeping track of the number of visits to Jerusalem, and it's probably a smart thing to do, this would be visit number four. There's no clever name to give to it because, well, uh, Acts doesn't say anything specific that happened there. And so this is just the end of the second missionary journey visit to Jerusalem.
Well, uh, we go to the next event, and then we have the third missionary journey. And so it starts at Antioch of um, uh, Syria, and uh, this time the Spirit allows them to go to Ephesus, and they're at Ephesus for a long time, for two years and three months. And we'll find out later on in this course that other things are happening, not always so happy things. And Paul actually has some other travels during this two year and three month, namely an emergency visit across the Aegean to Corinth. But let's not get confused with those details now. Let's focus in on the the big picture and, and think of the main events that you're reading about in Acts, Acts 18, 23 to 21, 26, about where Paul is going and what's happening to him on this third missionary journey. The collection is a big deal during this time. So Paul is hitting upon, if I might say it that way, his Gentile churches to contribute to an offering right, that he wanted to bring to the needy Christians in Palestine. And churches are giving money, and they're also giving people. So Paul has a growing entourage as he makes his way around the Aegean Sea, finally makes it to Corinth. He's there for three months, almost certainly a reference to the three months of the winter season when people don't sail. And so instead of sailing, there's a plot against his life. The group has to split. Some go by land, some go by sea, but they reconnect over at Troas. And again, you continue on the other events that you can read about on your own with regard to the third missionary journey. So once he arrives at Jerusalem, well, then we have the next event, right? Uh, maybe before I, before I get to that, um, this would then be, if you're counting, and again, it's good if you are, this would be the fifth visit of Paul to Jerusalem. And so this is the visit at the end of the third missionary journey where he comes to town with all kinds of cash and also with uh, a rather growing entourage. Well, his arrival in Palestine leads to conflict. Right? You can read in Acts about how there was a kerfuffle in the temple in Jerusalem. They saw Trophimus, a guy from uh, Ephesus, whom, who was a Gentile, and they wrongly thought Paul had brought him into the inner part of the, the, the Jewish court, right, which was strictly forbidden by penalty of death. And so there was kind of a mob descending on Paul, and uh, the Roman garrison is situated right there, and that's explanatory. That goes right back to Mark Anthony, uh, because if you want to keep an eye on the Jewish people, well, uh, you've got to keep an eye on their temple. And so for a long time, there was a military garrison situated right physically on the edge of the temple. So they kept an eye on the situation, and they saw this disturbance, and so they kind of came down and rescued Paul. And you maybe remember the conversation about citizenship and the plot against Paul's life. And, and so in the middle of the night, Paul is uh, squired away to Caesarea. To Caesarea. And thus begins his two-year imprisonment in Caesarea. So we have one governor at the beginning, Felix. right? And Felix will be replaced later on by another governor, Festus. Before that happens, though, um, it may be good to uh, note that the Sanhedrin, right, in Jerusalem, the, the council of the Jews made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, said to Felix, hey, you know, this is just some internal Jewish matter, you know, uh, give it over to us. And this is a dangerous situation for Paul because the penalty uh, for this is death. And Paul desperately does not want uh, these Jewish Sanhedrin, you know, who have it in for him to have a final say on the matter. And so Paul does something quite clever, which maybe you'll appreciate now that we've kind of done a little bit more study about Paul's life, his person, his background. Paul gets before the Sanhedrin and says, with full deliberation, I stand before you as a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, boldly professing my belief in the resurrection of the dead. So I hope you understand how this would right away divide the Sanhedrin. Those who are Pharisees would see Paul as a, as a kindred person, one who belonged to their own group, and that would drive a wedge between them and the Sadducees. And what's more, the Sadducees were the only group within Judaism, we know of anyway, who denied the bodily resurrection. So that was another difference between these two groups. And so uh, the result is, as Paul had hoped, they can't reach a consensus, and so Paul is kind of spit back under the control of the Roman governor. And so then he resides there in prison, or maybe better, house arrest, under Felix. And then we have the new governor, Festus, and Paul's trial, so to say, comes up again. And it's then that Paul holds up his um, apostleship card, and he appeals uh, to Caesar, which was his right to do. Well, that then leads into the next category, Paul's journey to Rome. And again, 
excuse me, uh, if we uh, read Acts, Acts 27, 1 to 28, 31, we get a pretty dramatic uh, story of how this journey takes place. And you can read that on your own and begin to appreciate some of the details that went into Paul's uh, travels. And, and all this makes sense historically in terms of the size of the ship. We have other ancient evidence about large ships like that sailing on the Aegean Sea. Also, um, uh, multiple ships traveling this way because uh, the grain from Egypt was... Uh, uh, Rome was almost uh, with a million citizens and they had this uh, grain distribution, sometimes free, sometimes most often at a subsidized rate. Um, uh, Rome was kind of in an unhealthy way dependent on the grain provided by Egypt and so their ships constantly plying the Aegean and so even though one ship is destroyed they could easily pick up another ship and also the whole business of not sailing on the three months too is all things that fit very much the geography, the weather pattern, and the travels uh, that are part of understanding the ancient world and still part of traveling on the Aegean Sea today. Well, Paul finally makes it to Rome, and we go to the next category, uh, almost at the end, and that is his Roman imprisonment. And we know that at least two years Paul was under house arrest. The Sunday school picture actually is kind of accurate because Paul's not in jail, right? Uh, he has some freedom to receive guests, and he has a picture of him preaching or proclaiming the gospel. And Paul was there for two whole years, right, openly proclaiming the gospel. And that's where Acts ends. Now, you might be disappointed and say, wait a minute, what happened to Paul the rest of his life? And somehow fault Acts for not telling us that. But remember, Acts is not an autobiography of Paul. Remember, Paul doesn't even appear on the scene until chapter 7. And therefore, not surprisingly, it doesn't end with his death, because Acts is not about Paul. Acts is about, well, chapter 1, right? Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses, first to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so you have these concentric circles as the gospel is spread further and further to the ends of the earth. And so Acts ends with Paul in the capital city of Rome, the heart of the Roman Empire, boldly and openly proclaiming the gospel. Now, the last category needs some further explanation. Notice it's entitled Fourth Missionary Journey, but it has a question mark at the end, and you should wonder about that. Was that a typo on my part, or is that deliberate? And it is deliberate because there's a bit of uncertainty about this fourth missionary journey. And so a good question to ask is, why even hypothesize, I'm choosing my verb carefully here, right, that Paul was released and engaged in a fourth missionary journey? Where did that come from? Well, we certainly don't have enough about that journey to qualify it for a map, as I found here in some Bibles. That's going way beyond what the evidence of Scripture allows. But the idea of a fourth missionary journey is, first of all, demanded, if I w might say it this way, by references in the pastoral letters. When I say pastoral letters, that means a First and Second Timothy and Titus. Because there are references to people and places in these letters that have to be accounted for somewhere in Paul's life. So take, for instance, Titus. It's clear that Titus is ministering to a church established on the island of Crete. Paul says, the reason I left you in Crete, right? Now, you know, perhaps already now from your study, something about Paul's first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, his third missionary journey. And, and I could say to you, when was Paul ever in Crete? And uh, as far as we know, uh, not on any of those journeys. So that means that Paul must have been in Crete sometime to start a church there. And that happened either earlier in Paul's life than his uh, Roman imprisonment or later than his life. And there are difficulties in putting it earlier. And so mostly evangelical scholars postulate then this fourth missionary journey that Paul was released from prison, engaged in yet further missionary activity before he was rearrested and then finally killed. I said evangelical because the evidence, remember, comes primarily from First and Second Timothy and Titus, and many higher critical scholars, many in the academy, don't believe that Paul wrote these letters, that these are pseudonymous letters written in Paul's name, and so they find it easy just to dismiss these places and these people. But for us evangelical Christians who take uh, scripture as uh, inspired and authoritative. Uh, we can't dismiss with that evidence so easily. And so we do postulate that Paul may have been released. And when we do some further uh, uh, further study on the matter, there is some strong evidence of that. 
I don't have a slide for this, so, but just permit me to say that the idea of exile was an extremely common form of punishment in the ancient world. There are lots and lots of especially leading and important figures who instead of being killed or something else nasty happening to them, were exiled for a period of time. Uh, this happens, of course, you know, to say John, right, the writer of the book of Revelation. He's situated in Ephesus, but read that he is exiled to the island of Patmos. Caesar Augustus exiled his own daughter, Julia, to an island. Um, uh, Cicero or Seneca, I'm sorry, I'm a little rusty on that. I think it's Cicero, got into trouble with one of the emperors, and uh, he was exiled uh, to Thessaloniki for six months. And there are other important figures from the ancient world, especially writers who, who wrote things that were kind of uh, digs, uh, kind of criticism of the emperor of Rome. And the emperor hears about it and kind of punishes them by sending them to some, some place. And then this person writes, you know, uh, oh, life is so boring over here. I used to live the high life in Rome, but now I'm stuck here in the middle of nowhere because of so-and-so. And so the whole idea of an important person being exiled is a very common phenomenon. And I say important person. Paul was important in the sense that he was a Roman citizen, right? If you were a lower class person, a nobody, uh, Rome would just kill you. They're, you know, they're not going to house you and put you in prison for a long time. They'd just get rid of you. But for an important person, uh, it may be more more negative by killing you than by just banishing you for a while, right? If you've got a lot of followers, maybe more bad things will happen from that than, than good. And so it's entirely feasible, uh, historically speaking, that Paul was released. And there's further evidence of that. So we have evidence from Romans, I'm beginning first with Scripture, that Paul at least wanted to go to Spain, right? When he writes to the Romans, he says, I've been trying to visit you many times, and I'm hoping you're going to help me get on to Spain. So Paul had a big desire to go further west to Spain. And we have uh, church fathers like Clement of Rome, who make statements about how, how Paul had been seven times in chain and had been driven into exile, all right? And so that's suggestive about what happened to Paul and how he preached not only in the East, but also in the West. The Muratorian Canon, right, it has uh, this important line, the departure of Paul from the city of Rome when he journeyed to Spain. So it seems to suggest that Paul did actually make it to Spain, and that didn't happen anywhere earlier in his life. Maybe this happened during that release period after the Roman imprisonment. Maybe that happened during the fourth missionary journey. You have Eusebius, a little later in time, but uh, he was the bishop of Caesarea and a church historian, and he says, quote, after pleading his cause, that is, before the emperor, Paul is said to have been sent again on a ministry of preaching, and after a second visit to the city, that is Rome, he then finished his life with martyrdom. So these are the texts which are suggestive. It isn't a slam dunk. That's why I have a question mark at the end. But there is strong evidence that Paul then would have been released after the two-year or whatever ministry. We don't know how long it lasted. Nero was the emperor, but uh, Paul would have been exiled. And then let me quote again to you 1 Corinthians 9. Right? Paul says, Woe to me unless I preach. Just because Nero or some emperor or there's some imperial decision prohibits him from doing that, that's not going to stop him. And so he preaches. That's a public ministry. It quickly gets him into trouble again. And then it would have been found out that this regards a previous charge. And this time there is no banishment, but instead death. And so we have the iconography. This, of course, is very recent, but it's accurate because you see Paul not being crucified like Peter was, as church tradition has it. Peter is just a nobody, right? But Paul's a citizen. And that means that you're killed in a more humane way. You may not like the idea of beheading, but believe me, it's a lot more humane than the way you'd kill a common criminal, right? With crucifixion or some other means. And so they would have taken Paul outside the city. Why? Because no one was killed inside the city, or hardly no one, because no one's buried in the city, right? That's considered unclean. So all the graves and the cemeteries uh, in the ancient world are always found outside the city walls. So Paul is taken outside the city wall, and he is likely beheaded. And so um, this spot became a holy site uh, to the earliest Christians, and somewhere along the line they built a church honoring Paul and that place where he was martyred and believed to be buried. And so they gave it the uh, not-so-easy-to-say title, St. Paul Outside the Walls Church, because indeed Paul was killed and buried right outside the walls of Rome, and a church was built there. And you can see there uh, still there's a crypt containing supposedly the, rem the remains of Paul, and uh, many people come here and venerate him still uh, today.
And this may be uh, in light of, here's another image too, of course, Paul being beheaded, right, uh, in, uh, in, in classic Roman fashion. This may, uh, may put a different light on Paul's writing to the Colossians. So Paul was in prison. He was under house arrest, either first or second time when he wrote to the Colossians. At the very end of the letter, he, he says, remember my chains, right? Remember me being in prison or in house arrest. Remember me who was willing to pay the price of being a follower of Jesus. Jesus, even a price that ultimately resulted in his beheading. I mean, I, I don't know if it, it, it sounds a little more shocking, but if Paul says, remember my decapitation, right? We ought to remember still the Apostle Paul, right? Who had this divine obligation to preach the gospel. Paul, who, who couldn't help but preach the gospel, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. And it doesn't matter what Rome or anyone else says, this is what I'm called to do. And by God's spirit, I'm empowered to do. And you see also the zealous Paul here uh, throughout his life, not just before he became a believer, the days when he was an opponent trying to destroy the church, but Paul who was filled with zeal from the beginning of his life to his end, who was willing to travel thousands and thousands of miles. I hope you're impressed by how much he endured, how much he had to suffer, all for the sake of Christ. And it becomes a, a rather powerful challenge for you and me Right? Uh, those to whom God has also placed an obligation to either preach or to teach the gospel. And are we willing to go anywhere and do anything? Are we also filled with the kind of zeal and passion that the Apostle Paul had as he sought to be a follower of Christ? Well, dear friends, now you know not only about Paul the letter writer, but also Paul the missionary. And this better appreciation of his life, I'm sure, will make you a better reader and understander and proclaimer and by God's Spirit a liver of his letters.